So today we're going to talk about probability and sampling and maybe get into distributions. Um, but before we do that, we are going to have a couple of announcements. Oh, the yeah, awesome poll. Oh, actually, so yeah, I'm going to do the theatrical poll real quick, but also I just dropped the lecture 11 uh, uh, notebook in the materials folder if you want to follow along. All right, I just completely forgot to put it over there. All right, and once you get a chance, uh, go to Piazza and do the attendance poll. Uh, let's say the number is four. And then, yeah, and so, okay, so just a reminder midterm is going to be on the 17th of March. Um, and so that's the Friday after you're back. So it'll be during the discussion section. So it'll be a little less awkward than trying to do it here. Um, and then keep in mind that Lab 5 has some problems with the grader checks on grade scope. Uh, the local ones, I think, are working correctly, but there's a bug in one of the ones on the grade scope, which I will hopefully fix tomorrow. Um, it works fine for me. So I'm not 100% sure what's going on. Yeah. Well, the lecture on the 16th be reviewed. So I actually been thinking about doing the lecture on whatever the two days, the uh, doing that with review um, to kind of separate it a little bit to give you a chance to kind of actually read up on it before the actual exam. Um, so that was my plan. The midterm review guide, um, I think it has a bug either because I moved it out, right? So I want to change a little bit about what it covers. So I want to make sure the midterm review guide covers all the way through the content that will be tested on the 17th. That content, you should expect that content to be all the content we've covered up through the 16th, okay? Um, however, the 16th will be very light if there at all, okay? Um, so we want to make sure the midterm review guide has all the material I wanted to cover. Uh, and so then I'll post it to Piazza maybe today, but more likely tomorrow. Um, but I do want to get it out pretty soon so you have a chance to review it. Uh, any other? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to confirm what the attendance number was. Four. Four. Any other questions? Yeah. Pop out, we're currently still not using. So uh, I even have uh, a link that says no top hat slides for myself to remind me. Uh, so we're not using it. I'm going to hopefully try to figure out what I want to do there over spring break. Any other questions? Yeah. All right. So midterm format, just to give you a sense of it, um, we're not going to do the review today, just kind of give you an idea of what it will be like. Um, so the base rules, um, when you kind of walk into the room, the expectation is you're going to pick one device that you're going to do anything that is involving a computer on. Everything else goes in your bag or whatever and goes to the side of the room. Okay, we've had problems in the past. Basically, I don't want to give any advantages to people who have, you know, six devices and so therefore can have 16 things open at once. Um, and I've also had problems with other forms of cheating in the past with it. So I'd like to just put it off to the side of the room. If you have a particular concern about that, for example, you desperately need to be available to someone, uh, you know, for an emergency phone call or something like that, uh, please just let the proctor know. I will likely be there, but it may be Rohan, uh, you know, or we may be back and forth. So just let whoever's proctor know that you need to keep it and that you, you can just put your phone or whatever down under your seat or something like that. Um, Let's see. Yeah, and so just keep in mind, if you are discovered to be using an electronic device that is not the approved one that you're taking the exam on, you will instantly get a zero for the exam. Okay? Um, some of the exam will be closed book, okay? Not 100% sure yet whether that will be literally written or on grade scope with kind of an expectation that you're not using any other website. Um, I've kind of gone back and forth on both. Uh, so, but the kinds of questions that you'll see in the closed part 
will be things that don't involve like actual programming, but may involve like a method name or something. So I try to give two quick examples here. Um, so no, I don't. I do it on the next slide. So okay. So so closed book just means you don't have access to anything. Okay, aside from the materials I give you. Okay, so you won't have a computer open if it's written. Make sense? So do bring a writing utensil, your favorite writing utensil. Make sure it's dark enough because we do scan them into GradeScope so that um, it's if you have a digital copy and then we do the grading on the digital copy because uh, I think it's easier for everyone. Um, so but just keep in mind, please try to make sure you have something that writes dark. Um, and then the open part uh, will be open book. So I don't know which one I call it, but it's like open book, open web, open whatever. You cannot have a sheet of paper that has all your notes on it, okay? But you can have a Google Doc that does. That makes sense? So I still want the only thing on your desk to be the actual computer you're taking the test on. Um, and then, but you can't use like phone, tablets, whatever. Um, and so, yeah. I mean, there's more details. I shouldn't have broken the slides the way I did. Um, and we'll post the study guide to Piazza. Uh, like I said, hopefully today, maybe tomorrow. Or likely tomorrow, would be my guess. Okay, so closed portions. So questions about definitions, common methods, et cetera. So for example, what does causality mean? Okay, so I'm gonna want a written response that defines it. Or for example, what method do you use to aggregate rows in a table? Anyone? Yeah. All right, there you go, group. Um, as you might guess, that will probably not appear on the exam, uh, but that's the idea, is that it's just a single method that you probably should know the name of and what it's used for. Um, and all of those are kind of covered in the exam guide, so uh, you should it shouldn't be any surprise which ones we think they are. They're also the ones you use every time you do a homework in a lab, right? Um, okay. Then on the open portion, so it's going to be very similar to a homework or a lab. You'll have a Jupyter notebook um, and be trying to solve some problem like you would with homeworks. Um, and so if it were me, I would prep something like a Google Doc with basically links and notes, uh, maybe cutting and pasting from other Jupyter notebooks for you know how to approach something. For example, that would be my recommendation. You can do whatever you like. Uh, I would also link to the study guide, so you can use that for reference. Um, however, keep in mind that because it is an open book or whatever, if, you, if you're learning it all while you're taking the exam, you will not finish it, right? So you really need to be pretty familiar with it, but then you have that kind of backup, right? Because you can't remember whether it's the second or third parameter, the group that takes the function. Does that make sense? So that's the kind of that's the kind of openness you should be expecting, not that you're going and trying to find the answer to this particular question. Okay. I think that's all I had to say. Any other any questions? Yeah. Over break, will there be virtual office hours? No. Any other questions? Cool. I think it would be hilarious. What if I answered only in person? Well, uh, that, I'd be curious. Um, okay, so just uh, kind of a little bit of a review. Um, I had a number of uh, often hour questions kind of about uh, control statements. We covered them pretty quickly last time. So I just want to kind of give you, here's that formal definition again. These are very important, okay? Um, and But then I have some examples on the next slide. So I'll talk about those in a minute. But and if I think the if is, is not the hard one, right? So the if is very much like what you expect to do, you know, if this, then do this thing over here, right? The four, I think people find a little bit more confusing. So just imagine it's, you know, for, you know, every one of these things, do this thing, okay? Um, and so let me show you the example. Um, so, from the computer. So there's your this if sorry um, and so uh, just in this I used uh, square uh, tra uh, sorry angle brackets to indicate where you'd like write some code here right versus like keyword um, and then a squiggly bracket okay 
uh, which is yes, the technical term as far as tech people are concerned for that wavy line thing. Um, squiggly brackets indicate variables. Okay, so in an if statement, you don't normally have kind of any variables that are defined by the if statement, but you do with a for loop and a method call. Okay, so what we think about is for each in the list. Okay, so if I have a bag of apples, okay, I'm going to take the bag of apples, and then I'm going to take one out, right, and I'm going to assign it to the each in this case. Now I have an apple, right? Now I'm going to core that out, let's say, and then I'm going to put it back, you know, and put it in another bag, right? Then I'm going to go get the next apple, okay? Now my each is assigned to the next apple, okay? One of the things that's very common is for each to be uh, like a letter, like just a variable name, okay? Like the letter I, which is short for index. So if you think about that list of whatever that you have, right? It's an index in each position of that thing, but it's already assigned to each. So you get it immediately. Um, and then, and so keep in mind, right? So then the code in there, each is only valid within that for loop block, okay? So you see how it's tabbed over? That's that scope we talked about before. So each will only be available while you're in that scope. Okay? And the scope in Python is indicated 99.9% .9 of the time by basically how far something is tabbed in, okay? So because it's tabbed in once, that means that each will only be available until you tab out again. Make sense? Okay. With the method, it's very, very similar, okay? Except we do it a little bit differently in that, okay, we give it a name of a method, but that can be kind of arbitrary. You don't really use that anywhere except if you're trying to call the method. Right? But you have something that's equivalent to the each with this arg, right, or an argument. So I just called it arg1, okay? And you can have an unlimited number of that, right? But that R1 is now assigned to whatever the method was called with. Okay, so one way I can do this, right? Let's say my core apple operation is actually a method. So I could have for each apple, right, in my bag of apples, call apple core, okay, which might be the method name. And then the apple would be what you pass here. So you pass the each to R as R1. And then in here would be my apple. And I would do the coring activity, whatever that means. Okay. So just keep in mind that whatever's passed into here is R1. And, it, and R1 only exists while you're in this area, okay, in that scope. So why do you do this? Because you want to be able to genericize some operation. So, like pouring, maybe we have a fruit pouring method, okay, and it could, it could pour any kind of fruit. Could be an apple, could be a pineapple. Right? It could be an orange. I've never heard of anyone coring an orange, but who knows? But the idea is that my, my coring function doesn't necessarily need to know that it's an apple or an orange or a pineapple or what, which one it is in the bag, right? All it cares about is I can core things. Okay? And so when you pass it in, R1 is just whatever it is that you want to have cored, and then it's going to do its normal operation. But if you try to pass in, let's say, uh, uh, for a thing of argument, you try to pass in a coconut, your coring tool doesn't work because coconut's hard. Okay, so if you try to pass something into it that doesn't, isn't able to be cored, you're going to have a bad time, but there's nothing wrong with the method, right? You're just going to get an error because you're trying to, you know, put, put your coring tool into a coconut and you can't do it. Okay, so just keep in mind that it has to be the right type of thing that they expect. But in general, what you're trying to do with method is genericize the operation and uh, you know, make it so that you can reuse that code all over the place. Okay? And we'll be using methods like this a lot. So you saw me, I think, in the last one, um, you know, talking about how to do our uh, simulate one, one dice game, right? One dice, a set of dice roll. But I, even then, I want to simulate one dice roll die roll. Um, so if I genericize it, right, then I can just reuse that code. And then let's say I decide that I want to use a die that doesn't have, let's say, six sides, and I want to make it a 20-sided die roll. I only have to change it in one place now, 
right? Just in that role method. Same with here, right? If it was my two coring app, okay, and I change how the coring works, I only have to change it in one place. And now everything that was being passed to it before still works as it did before. Okay. Any questions? Okay. All right. So anyone familiar with the Monty Hall problem? All right. So whether you're familiar with the Monty Hall problem or not, do you know who Monty Hall is? Game show host. A game show host. Uh, and I think his most recent show was, I don't know, let's go with probably 30 years ago, maybe 20 years ago. Um, but this is a really interesting problem because uh, basically your gut instinct is wrong for most people. And this is a really good example of probability. Um, if you want more details on it, these links might be useful. Um, you'll be able to see them when the slides are uploaded better. Um, sorry. So the Monty Hall problem. Um, sorry. So the Monty Hall problem starts off with the game show. Uh, what do you call the name of the game show? Uh, let's make a deal. That's what it is. Okay, so let's make a deal. So you have a contestant, um, and uh, you have two contestants, really, and you have three doors. And Monty Hall tells you that behind one door is a car, okay? Behind one door is, um, uh, let's say, a certain amount of money. Um, and behind the last door is go. Okay. And the story here, right, is that you don't want the goat. Now, I don't know how you feel about goats. Maybe you do want the goat, but in this case, you don't want the goat. <clears throat> so the question is the way the game was structured is that the um, the first contestant would be at the Monty Hall, let's make a deal. Okay. Which door would you like to choose? Okay. So they choose one of the doors. Okay, then Monty then reveals one of the other two doors. Okay, and that always, sorry, I guess it's a car and two goats, my bad. Um, but so it reveals one of the other two doors. And so you have now, uh, you know, you know a little bit more about the scenario. So the question then Monty Hall puts back to you is do you wish to change the door you chose or stick with the one you had? All right. So what do you all think? So you don't know what's behind your door and there's one other door that's unknown. And now one door has been revealed as being not the thing you want. So raise your right hand if you think you should stick with your existing guests or should you switch to the other door? And that's the left hand. All right, so this is my right hand. Okay, so um, all right. So the answer is that you should stick with what you have, okay? Because the problem actually hasn't changed even though they revealed part of it. And so your, your uh, probability of, of being right uh, is actually better now of sticking with the same goal. So we'll talk through that in a minute. All right. So. Okay, so let me just start it here. So first, we set up the problem. Yeah, go ahead. No, I'm pretty sure you're supposed to switch. Like 90% sure yeah. you're supposed yeah. to switch. Are you supposed to? Uh, I'm say it backwards. Um, you can <laughs> stay at two thirds if you stay at one third. Yeah. yeah, you are supposed to switch. You're right. Um, yeah, I like have a mental block. I yeah. <laughs> and I usually look at it right before the class, and then 50% of the time I still get wrong. Um, yeah. So I don't know, we'll find out for sure because we're actually going to do the math, right? So, um, okay, so the first thing we do is we set up the scenario because what we want to know is what is the right answer, but we can do this a couple different ways, right? We can actually do the math and do probability and actually figure it out, or we can simulate it, right? Because we know how to program with things like for loops and methods, maybe we can actually try it, 
Okay. Um, and so we set up uh, a scenario basically where, okay, we have my choice happen to be gate goat one. Okay. We don't know this at the time, but it's the, you know, we choose the goat one door. Then they reveal goat two. And the last choice is actually the car. Okay. So what we want to do is come up with a table first that is all the options. Okay. Now we don't have to literally make a table, but we're displaying it here so you see what they are. So you want to make sure you know what all the options are. He going to get that wrong. All right. <clears throat> oh, sorry. All right. So the first thing I do is like create the doors, right? And so I want to create one of the one of the possibilities. And so now I need a method, right, that is going to tell me kind of what is going to happen, right? So, all right, let me just let's do the slides over here. I'm sorry, my cheat sheet, I uh, I reordered it incorrectly. Um, okay, so what I want to do is I want to write a method that tells me kind of, like I said, what happens, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, if I get a go, and that is equal to the first go, Then I'm going to return the other go. Okay. However, <clears throat> if I get the second go, then I'm going to return the first go. Oops. Because basically, in this scenario, for this part of the method, right, what I want to do is I just need something that will get, like, if I pass in one of the goats, I want to get back the other goat. Okay. So I know whether it's goat one or goat two. So I'm going to just create that method. All right. And so, you know, just kind of doing testing. Um, and if you notice, right, because of the way I, I constructed that method, if I pass something in that's invalid, I don't get a result at all. Okay, so I don't get first go or second go, I get nothing. Okay, because I don't have a return statement at the kind of at the root, right? It's only within the statements. So in this case, that's kind of a good thing. Usually, what you want to do there is like, cause some sort of error or it indicates to the user somehow that they're calling method not well. All right. So let's make basically a Monty Hall kind of simulate simulate for. Um, and so what we need to do to do that, right, is we need to kind of create the scenario without any humans being involved. Right. So what I want to do is I want to have the contestant choose a random door. Uh, choose a random door and then use that door to indicate what should happen next. So what I do is I use the MD random choice, which we talked about last time, based on that set of doors that I made up here. Right. So here's that set of doors. And it's just going to pull one randomly. So we don't know which one it's going to pull. So now we can say if the contestant has the choice is the first go, then oops, then we want Monty's choice. We're gonna call it Monty's choice. So basically, what is Monty gonna reveal? Okay, we're gonna say Monty. Yeah. 
can do. Right, and then now we know that the remaining door is going to be equal to the car, right? Because there's there's very strict rules here, right? Is that if you chose like like Monty always reveals a goat, right? And that's part of what makes this work. All right. So, however, if the contestant has has been. had chosen, now obviously they don't know this, but they had chosen the second goat, then we want Monty to reveal the first goat. Then I forgot the number of characters. And then the remaining door still has the car. Remaining door. And then we have kind of our last scenario. Which is the captain can actually manage to choose the car. And so they're going to get car and then Monty is still going to return a goat, right? But here's where our little prior function comes in handy, which is that we're going to say, give me one of the goats. Um, and so oops, not quite yet. Sorry, my bad. Um, so MP random choice, we need to choose one of the goats at random and we can pull that out of the array of goats, and then the remaining door is going to have the other goat. And then lastly, we want to return all of that information, but we want to return it as an array so that we kind of separate them out, right? So we're going to say contestant, as far as the list, I guess, choice, then Monty choice, and then remaining door. Okay, so a couple things point out here, right? So what we want to do is make sure this is random, right? So if they chose the car, then we want to make sure that the, the goat we choose to show them is random. So that we're not like accidentally biasing our cats, right? So if we include the random goat there, but then obviously we have to put the other goat for the remaining door when we're trying to simulate this. And then I want to put in with that. Oh, um, and so in order to kind of make all this happen, and then I want to return the result. Okay, but the result, I actually have three pieces of information I need to return. So I'm actually going to return them as a list of results. Does that make sense? All right. So now oh, we find our bug. Oh. So first of all, that's the wrong graphic or wrong character. And this is symbols. Um, so this is a very common mistake. Um, it's much worse when you kind of do it in another place, but just be very, very careful of whether you're using double equals or single equals, right? Double equals is a comparison, single equals is assignment. And it's very, very easy to do the wrong one. And it's not always caught quite so nicely. Okay, so. Now I can just call it, right? And if I keep calling it, I should get different results, right? So now I'm starting to simulate all of the various scenarios. So what we can do is let's maybe make a table of that. Okay, so we can call Montel once and it's basically gonna repent the elements Right, we call that and we're going to pass it an array. So it's going to put me in a new row using <clears throat> N um, for guests revealed and remaining. But then this is where it starts to get interesting. Not our network connected. 
which is that. Does anybody have any ideas? How do I, how would I get 3,000 of these games to play? And then I want them all in the table. So how would I play this game 3,000 times so that I don't have to do the math because I'm lazy? Any ideas? I'll try. Um, it's for I am and he got a range three thousand. Right on. Okay, and then what am I going to do each time? Right. What do y'all think? Return Monty Hall. I don't need to return it. What about, where do I want the result of Monty Hall? Like the Monty Hall method call, where do I want the result? I want it in my games table, right? So how do I how do I get it out of the game table? All right, so here's a trick, okay? When you're trying to do something like a for loop where you're trying to genericize something, or when you're trying to write a method that you're trying to do something generically, if you write it the way you would do it one time first, then it's much easier to figure out how to do it kind of many times. And so if you notice, what I did right up there at the very top of the screen is I did it one time, okay? So what do you think I need to do to make this work? So now I want 3,000 of them to land in that same table. How do I do that? Any ideas? Well, it's, it's very easy because you cheat, which is you take this, it worked for one, and now I can just run it 3,000 times, right? So now, going to be a little bit off because I already had some stuff in it, but that's the idea, right? So, and you're going to do this a ton because what we want to do for a lot of kind of data science scenarios, we run our own simulations, okay? And this is a simulation. So now we have 3,000 attempts at this game and we know what the outcome is, right? So we know that the person guessed that, uh, let's just say, you know, this one, they guessed first goat, then Monty revealed the second goat, and the, the third door, the remaining door, had the car. So what does that mean we can do? Now that we have 3,000 of those, what could we do with this table of data if we want to know which door to choose? Do we want to stick with the original guess, or do we want to choose the other door? So not, not what's the answer, but how would I how would I use this to figure out what the answer should be? Exactly. So that way you can say, hey, look how often car is, if, if car is always in remaining, right? Then that means I should switch my guess, right? But if car is always in first guess, then I should keep my guess, right? Does that make sense? So, So what we can do is now we can use that cool function that I keep saying we're going to use a ton, which is group, and look at oops, how often things end up in remaining. Okay, so now we know that one thousand nine hundred eighty-seven times, okay, of our three thousand, the remaining door has the car. Okay. And then the remaining has whatever, just shy of 500, and then the second go just over 500. Okay, so this is starting to maybe go a different direction. So 
a mouse here. Okay, so what might I do now to get a, a little, can I do a visual version of this? How can I get a visual version of that same information? Any ideas? Like I just want a graph. So what kind of graph could I use that would show me that uh, so I can do the comparison without having to do math? In a bar graph? A bar graph. How would I do a bar graph? Bar H. Sorry? I heard somebody say something, but I missed what. Dot bar H. Yeah, so, but dot bar H on what? Uh, so you don't quite want to do it that well. You kind of do, but you kind of don't. You want to move first, because otherwise it's not going to tell you something very interesting. So you want to do basically the exact same thing you did before. And then bar H, but on the remaining. And so now we can have a visual representation of the same thing, right? Uh, this can be really useful, especially if the numbers are really close, right? It can be much more obvious that they're their distribution, or if you have a lot of them. All right. So let me just. So what does this help us conclude? That I should switch or not switch? So I was right the first time. You should switch. So I think that's what we said, right? I can't remember which way we said it. Like you said, I can, this thing confuses me every single time. I always say it backwards. It's kind of like one of those things where it's like, I know what the right answer is, but I can't get it out of the house. So, but what this is telling us, right, is that what you want is the remaining door, right? Because you don't, because, right? Otherwise, because most of the time you're going to get the car, okay? And the reason, basically, the reason is, is that despite the fact that a piece of data has been revealed, it has not turned it into a 50 50 chance. The, the probability has remained the same. And so we'll talk about the probability. Okay, so why? Oh, that's why I need to review. Oh, and uh, oh, sorry. And so part of the reason the popularity of this is basically this problem was kind of presented uh, in like 1990 in People Magazine. So it made huge, like kind of general pop culture kind of impact, right? Instead of being just, you know, a math question. Um, but it was actually, a, I think a statistician who kind of talked about the problem and answered the question, but it, it landed in a very popular magazine. Okay, so hopefully for most of you, um, you have some experience with probability. Um, and so basically, there's a couple of things I, you know, think most people find tricky about this, right? Which is that when you talk about probability, you're really just talking about between zero and one hundred and one. Okay, it is not a hundred, right? Those are two different numbers. A hundred percent and hundred are not the same number. Okay, so when you talk about probability, you're just saying between zero and one. And so if it's zero, there's no chance of it ever happening in the entire, you know, history or future of the world. Okay. So there is no chance it will happen ever. Whereas one is the opposite. Okay. And so the very, very common error is when you're typing in numbers or whatever, is to type in 100 and kind of lose that with that sign. Okay. Or also happens with 27, right? If you're talking about 27% and 27, those are not the same number. Okay. So 27% is 0.27. So just be very careful that because. You you won't see it, right? You'll just get wildly wrong results, um, and you won't get an error, right? Because it's it's doing exactly what you told it, 
you know, you're doing 27 for this thing when what you meant was 0.27. So you'll be doing whatever it is, 2700 uh, percent chance. The other thing that's kind of interesting is that is the complement, and we talk about the complement here and then somewhere else as well, or like in the future as well, um, which it may not be obvious, right? But if you're talking about in this example, right, if you have a 70% chance of doing something, that means that there's a 30% chance of it not doing it, right? If there's a complement, there's always an opposite. That's the rest of the space between zero and one. Why is this interesting? The reason is, is because sometimes it's significantly easier to get to find the 30% and not the 70%. So even though your question is asking you to go after this number, sometimes it's much easier to find this number and to subtract it from 100. Okay? Or if you think about it in reverse, if the question was asking you to find, you know, and, and the answer was 30%, Sometimes it's a lot easier to find the 70%, subtract it from 100, and now you've got the answer that the question is looking for. Does that make sense? Okay, and I think, I don't know if we're going to talk about today, but uh, might be in the future, but there, we have a good example of like um, when it's much easier to find the complement than it is to find the original, the thing you're actually looking for. Okay. But you can always just reverse it, so it's fine, right? Okay, so um, this is just kind of in English, the way you figure out how it goes. Okay, so just how many times are the possibility of it happening? Okay, and then the total number of possible outcomes uh, are all the citizens, and you just divide the one by the other. All right, but then we can also see, okay. So sometimes you actually have kind of a series of probable events, right? That you wanna know, like how do they relate to each other, okay? So, and I think the key for this one is the last one, which is really that you, you're kind of thinking about a scenario where, you know, um, you know, if it rains today, you know, uh, what are the chances are that um, you know the roadways will be slippery, you know, et cetera, right? So if you keep adding conditions, it gets less and less likely. That makes sense, right? As you kind of you can kind of gut instinct, I think, tell that, right? You know, if somebody has if you're looking for somebody who has red hair and blue eyes, they're gonna be harder to find than somebody who has red hair, right? So that's called the multiplication rule, and you can actually multiply it, and you will get the result that is the probability of that series of events also occurring. Then we have the other side, which is the addition rule. Oops. This is the addition rule, and so this will actually go up. So it's kind of like, okay, find me all the people who have red hair or brown hair, right? So obviously. If I find only people who have red hair, the probability is lower than if I'm looking for all the people who have red hair or brown hair. Make sense? So I kind of think of it in terms of that last part, which is just that, you know, if I'm, if there's multiple conditions that I'm trying to satisfy, the probability goes down. If there's uh, multiple ways to win, right, the multiple ways to find the person you're looking for, for example, then the probability goes up. And so why is that so important? Because this is where some of the math stuff comes in. Because if you're, let's say you're doing a series of probabilities and they're and you're expecting the number to go down, but you you made that typo with the decimal. And so now your probability has gone way up. You look at that and you're like, huh, I probably have a mistake, right? So that's why this is so useful to know is because if you you look at your results and it's going in the direction the wrong direction of what you expect, that you probably have an error, right? So you kind of keep in mind what, what you expect the outcome to be and use that as a way to, to kind of check yourself to see that it's doing what you think it's doing. Oh yeah, it is here. So this is the complement. Uh, example that I'm talking about, I thought it was later, but 
So if you imagine flipping coins, um, and so if I, you know, I have heads and tails, okay, and T is tails. So if I want any outcome except, um, sorry, so the, the, what we're looking for is at least one head. And so that means that the only thing that we need to ensure is that the reverse of all tails, right? So if uh, all the options are like, you know, all heads, two heads and a tail, you know, two tails and a head, et cetera, figure out what all those combinations are, not too hard when you're talking about flipping points, but imagine if it was die or something like that, it's much harder. So instead, because you're looking for like a very kind of open-ended result, it's a lot easier to say, hey, let's look for the one thing that does not satisfy the condition, figure out what the probability of that is, in this case, it's one eighth, right? Because we multiply one half by one half by one half, maybe, you know, going down in the chances that this happens. And then we just subtract it. So now we can see that the chances of always getting one head is get what, that result, right? Um, so at least one head is 87.5%, right? Because what you do is just subtract it from one. Or subtract from 100, you know, depending on how you want to think about it. So that's why it's super useful to to remember that the complement is there. All right. So now we're going to move on to simply, yeah. So the first thing we're going to do here, if there's any changes, is we are going to, because I don't think we've, we've talked about this data set yet, um, but so this is flight information for United flights from some period in time. Um, and there's a counter here to make this easier. And if you notice, we added that counter in, okay? But that's for later. Um, but that's all that represents. It's not, it's not real data. Okay. But then here's the date of when the flight took place. Here's the flight number. This is what airport it's going to. Um, everybody know what EWR is? Newark. Newark. Oh, SEA. Yeah. All right. HNL. Nice. All right, pretty good. Uh, what are SEL? Yeah. And then SAM. And now that's the default. Uh, um, but you get the idea. What is it? I don't know, but it was kind of Uh, it might be. But I used to fly to San Antonio a lot, so I think I remember. It. But you never know. I don't know. Somebody will find it. It's very easy. It's San Diego. Um, is it San Diego? That's what I was thinking at first, but then I wasn't sure. Okay, so San Diego. And then, but this is the delay on that flight, okay? Uh, does anybody know how flight delays work? So this is the number of minutes before it left, okay? So has anybody ever gotten uh, taken a plane flight, right? And then gotten what's called gotten stuck on the tarmac? Mm -hmm. You ever done this? Raise your hand. All right, so you're very familiar with this experience. And we know why that happens. Is there not issues? Not, not the, the reason that they, they didn't take off. I meant, why do they put you on the tarmac? Oh, because um, the flight agents and stuff will time out if you don't close the door. Worse than that, but yes. Because if the flight, if the plane leaves the gate, it's not delayed. So for their numbers, they don't have a, they don't have a report a flight delay if it leaves the gate on. Nothing about you getting in the air or getting where you're going or any of that. Just the fact that it's left the gate. So a lot of the time, the reason that you get stuck in the tarmac is because they they just want to pull away from the gate so they don't have to report a negative flight delay. Um, so whatever. So this uh, is United Flights. Their delays in minutes. Uh, I will say um, that the the thing that are at the top gives a little bit of a skew of the data, but you know, um, it's, it's not as bad as as some of these examples. Okay. So moving on, 
How would we go about getting just the flight information for flights that are going to JFK? So I will start. Oh boy. Start with United. Then what do I do next? Dot where? Dot where? Where? Yeah, where what? Um, I don't know what the column name is called. Destination. Uh, where destination R equal to JFK. So yes, but there's easier because it's just a string. You can actually just do it correct. Um, you can also do it with the R methods, but if you're just doing a comparison like equals, you can just do it directly. Um, so this would get us the flights that are just JFK flights. Um, and then let's go. Uh, one thing I want to introduce more than because it's particularly useful at the moment, but you can also, if you want to, so actually, let me, let me back up just a little bit. So if I wanted to start to understand this data, right? So what I want to know is potentially, right, is like how often are flights coming, okay? So, but let's say that the data set I have is, oh, you know, a huge amount of data, right? Imagine all the flights that United did in just a year, okay? That's a fair amount of data. And really, to be realistic about this, we probably want to do, let's say, five years or 10 years. And what we want to know is, are United flights, do they tend to be delayed by how much? Okay, so we want a big amount of data for that. So how can we reduce the size of the data, but still get a valid result? Maybe average? So... Yes, except what I don't want to do is I don't want to average everything because there's too much data. So what we can do is what's called sampling. So I want to do is pull out part of the data and use that to calculate my average or whatever. Okay. So one way I can sample is by pulling out just one destination, right? That's obviously going to reduce the data by quite a lot. However, do you see a problem with doing that? Sampling bias, like if they delay a lot, point to the JFK. It's JFK. They delay all the time. Okay, that's not United's fault. It's JFK. Um, sorry, not that I dislike JFK at all. Um, uh, Paris is right up there too. Uh, so, so that's that's a bias, right? It's not going to give us probably a good answer. So we don't probably want to do that. But this is how we would go about it. Sometimes it does make sense, but. Uh, so another way I could do it would be to try to pull out something more random, right? And so <laughs> it, uh, okay. So what I can do is there's another method called take, which lets you pull out individual rows by position. Okay, so instead of saying like where it's equal to JFK, I can say I just want the eighth row. Okay, that's what take does. And it can be useful at times. And like right now, we're going to be it's going to be useful because we're going to do um, not that. And so. Let's say. What we wanted to do is like in our you know 100 million rows whatever let's say i want to pull out some of them okay let's say we want to pull out every thousand one okay so what i could do is now count the total number of rows and then do steps of a thousand nope Oh, I inflated the two, sorry. So what I did here was, hey, let's pull them a little bit more randomly, right? So I'm going to say, let's get every thousandth row and just use that as our data set. What do y'all think? How does this compare to pulling just JFK? 
Is that better? All right. Do you think it's good or is it just better? All right. Why? Why is it not good? Any ideas? Yeah. In order for data to be statistically viable, it has to be randomly sampled. So it doesn't always actually have to be randomly sampled, but uh, yeah. So so, but why in this case? Can you give me a theory about why this may not be valid? Not just in general, but kind of in the specific. So skew low. So we might skew one direction or the other. Like imagine, for example, maybe for whatever reason, every thousandth day, United gives out a prize to whoever gets the, you know, whoever takes the flight. Like, maybe that causes delays. Like you don't know. Like all sorts of things could be happening that are kind of outside your data but are affecting your data. Okay. So this is maybe actually almost as bad as just the AFK. Unless you happen to know a lot about what's going on with every thousand flight, right? Because otherwise, you, you may not know, right? There, let's say there could be a prize every thousand flight, which causes everything you build. Yes. All right. So moving to the next option, another way we could do it, right, would be to actually choose random numbers um, or choose kind of differently, like instead of jumping by a thousand, maybe we can jump by pieces or do it multiple times. We can just keep going crazy. However, we can just see. However, it might be it might be better if we started to actually introduce true randomness. <laughs> Although I say that with a grain of salt. By picking a number. as a new starting point, right? So instead of starting at zero, let's start from somewhere randomly at a thousand, right? So that will, so this will give us just a new number and it, it, it does make the assumption that there's at least a thousand records, which, you know, maybe shaky. But then I can now do United and take and, you know, start to introduce a little bit more randomness into our data set. But it's still, you know, not great. Right? Because we're still pulling every thousand, still, we're just kind of doing it from a different place. So maybe if I ran it a bunch of times, right, then maybe I would get a, a decent amount of randomness into it. But it's still pretty shaky. So we have, luckily, a much nicer tool also, which will execute much faster. Um, where we can actually just call a function called sample. And let's say I want, what did I say? I want to say oh, just like that. So, what this will do is actually get us a random set of rows from our data set. Okay. That, you know, we can't, because it's random, right? Do we know that this is actually a good representation of the data? What do you think? Not big enough of a sample. Okay, let's say it was bigger. Do we know if it is a good representation? Not for sure. Why not? No. You don't because it's random, right? So the problem with randomness is randomness. So not only is it a good thing in that you do want to pull a bunch of random samples, okay, but your random choices may not be good choices to be representative of your sample, right? Let's just say, going back to the JFK example, it's, you know, um, it's, let's just say, you know, when we did our random sampling, all we got was flights from JFK and Charles de Gaulle. I promise you the delay is much worse. Okay. But that could happen, right? It's a random selection. Does that make sense? Yes. So what we need to think about is that yes, the, the first part of the random is good, but we also may need to do it a bunch of times to make sure that 
we're not actually randomly selecting a bad example. Right? So that the next time I run it, maybe I get newer controls to call. Probably just as bad from the bill based perspective. Okay, but if I get St. Louis in Atlanta, uh, maybe St. Louis, maybe it'll be better, right? Because that's their pub, if I recall. Um, so they would actually get better. So I may need to actually randomly sample a bunch of times to actually make it random, if you follow. Yeah. Why not just take like the median delay? Because I'm making the assumption that we're not using a contrived example. And so as a result, we would have to spend a lot of money to get an average out of it. So we could, yes. But imagine that my United data set here was a couple hundred million rows, right? Then it, that is a little bit different. There are tricks to actually solve for some of that too, but that's why. Is we're trying to find a way to because it's it's all about money and time, right? So what we're trying to do with these techniques is we're trying to say, what's the smallest amount of work that we can do while still getting as close to a right answer as possible? So we want to have the smallest amount of work we can do that is within a certain window of the right answer. And we'll talk about those windows, P values, et cetera. That's what those are about is like, we know that this smaller amount of work is actually not accurate, but we also know that it's within this percentage of being accurate. That makes sense? So you have all these like uh, kind of ish, right, results, but as long as you can measure how much your ish is on correctness, that's okay. As long as you declare it, because the savings in effort and time, et cetera, and money um, is so good that it's worth it. So if you take, for example, you know, instead of, let's say, this United data, what if we were taking data that involved like humans? Collecting human information is very expensive because you have to go and talk to all the humans, okay? And you have to do it in certain ways so that you don't accidentally bias the data because it's people who are willing to take service, for example. So just collecting data can actually be the very expensive part. So if you know that that amount of data can be smaller, it's much cheaper and still be valid. All right. Almost out of time. So let's quickly talk about distributions. Oh, actually, sampling first. Um, so, so um, a deterministic sample is one that does not involve chance, and sometimes those are good. And sometimes that is what you want to do. You want to take a deterministic sample um, because you're trying to understand something about that set, right? Um, but then a random sample, which is a much more common scenario, much more likely what you would need to use. Um, the title is a random sample. And before the sample is drawn, you have to know the selection probability of every group of people in the population because not all individual groups necessarily need to have an, an equal chance of being selected. It can still be random even if there's kind of bias in the results because what you're looking for is a particular type of thing. So, for example, if we want to do some sampling, let's say, around race, and we know that a population of an area has these percentages of that race, we, we want to actually choose correctly based on the population for that area. That makes sense? So like, you know, if we're looking at Boston, we may want to look at what is the racial breakdown because what we're trying to find out is some other thing, but we need to know that the resultant sample population have the same racial makeup as actual Boston. So those are not equally choosable, but we have the right distribution. So that's important. Um, well, I said sampling again and again. And then a sample of convenience. So just quickly, a sample of convenience is one where uh, you, you know, kind of conveniently sample people. So this can be very, very dangerous. A lot of people run into this. Um, how many people here have been uh, randomly sampled on the street by either Scientologists, the, uh, that's a big one, um, uh, Greenpeace is another big one, um, anybody else? 
examples. Mormons. The Mormons, yes, you'll see the Mormons out sometimes too. Um, so, in a sense, they are actually doing convenient uh, examples of convenience. Um, but imagine, right, the problems here, right? If you're trying to figure out what the average salary of employees and, uh, who work for the city of Boston are, actually, let's say this back up. Let's say we want to find out the average salary of people who work in Boston, right? And then I go and do my survey in front of city halls. My data is going to be skewed because the people likely going in and out of City Hall work at City Hall, right? Whereas if I did it instead at a grocery store, maybe I would get a more random sample. Okay? So you want to think about how you do samples of convenience because they're really dangerous. Because what might happen at the grocery store if I go and do a sample of salaries at a grocery store? Any ideas? You could get them more like diverse set of people because most people have to go to a grocery store, but there's also a chance you could get a lot of people who don't work because they have time to take the grocery store. Uh that that or just the location of that grocery store, right? So imagine going to a Whole Foods in Newton, right? Versus like the Roach Brothers that's in downtown Cross. Okay. You're probably gonna get a skewed salary result. Right? So you have to be really, really careful with immune symptoms. Especially if you're not entirely sure of the population. Um, this is just quickly the, the functions I just used. Um, I'm not going to go through them again because I don't think we really have time. 